Now, one of the things I do besides telling stories, which I love to do, is I sing. You like to sing? Oh, I like yeah. to sing. You like to sing? Yeah. So do you mind if I put my next story to a little music? Oh, that yeah, that'd be wonderful. all right? All right? Yes. Sing it in so, story. Yes. Sing story. Sing my story. So, I told you I'm from Louisiana. I live right outside New Orleans. And well, I went to New Orleans and I walked around the block and I walked right into a donut shop and I picked up a donut and I wiped off the grease and I handed the lady a five cent piece. Well, she looked at the nickel and she looked at me and she said fine sir as you can plainly see there's a hole in the nickel and it goes right through and i said there's a hole in the donut too thanks for the donut tough luck <laughs> As some of you know, I went to China in 1991 and 92 to teach English to those Chinese folks, you know. So if you see anybody in the UN saying y'all, you'll know that they were in my, in my class. Uh, but when I got back, I, I was knew that I wasn't going to have much work, and I had been working just prior to doing that in Michigan as an actress uh, for Northern Michigan for Michigan Productions. And so my producer had arranged for me to do some storytelling at some of the libraries and libraries and so on. So I was at um, a school, Porter Elementary School, Porterville, right out of Lansing, and it was Easter time, 1992. And I realized I did not have an Easter story. They had all these second grade people there. So I said to the teachers, I said, gee, I don't have an Easter story. And they said, well, we have a story we want to tell you about. And they pulled out a copy of The Country Bunny and the Little Golden Shoes. Does anybody know that story? Well, I, I somehow, I had a lot of stories read to me, but never had that one read to me. So I learned that story and I told it then. And later, and I want to, we, we want to salute some of our dear storytellers that are gone from us. Ollie Deloach, an African-American storyteller who came here with her husband several times, knew that I told that story and she gave me her very own copy because she learned it as a little girl and it's a real beat up copy. And I'll tell you adults a little bit about the author when I finish the story, but here's a little bit of it. And I need my hat, what did I do? The hat is important in this story. So, get my props. Once upon a time, there was a little brown bunny. You know, like I know you have in Pearl River County and around here near Louisiana and near Gulfport, there are little bunnies hopping all around. And when she was a little bunny, she would say to everybody, when I grow up, I'm obey the Easter Bunny. Oh, and those long-legged Jack Rabbits would say, Cottonhead, you can't be the Easter Bunny. You a girl bunny. Everybody knows the Easter Bunny's a boy bunny. Oh, pair. When I grow up, I'm going to buy the Easter Bunny. And those tall white bunnies looked down their noses and said, Oh, my dear Cottontail, you cannot be the Easter Bunny. Everyone knows the Easter Bunny is a big white bunny. Okay, I'm going to be the Easter Bunny. But do you know? Cottontail did not become the Easter Bunny, not right off. Instead, <gasps> 21 little bunnies, oh my. She became a mommy bunny. And Cottontail discovered how much work it is to be a mommy bunny, just like it's work to be any kind of mommy. <sighs> she did not have time 
to teach her bunnies the important things, to teach them to run when the cars come at you and the lights are on you, gotta get out of the road. Run when you see Farmer McGregor with his big stick coming out from the garden, you gotta run from that. She did not have time to teach them the songs like, here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail. She did not have quality time to spend with her little bunnies. So she said to them, you know what? If everybody pitched in and helped around the house, maybe I'd have time for quality time. Y'all could all get chores. Do you like chores? <laughs> they didn't need them. But she taught that one how to sweep the floor. She taught that one how to make the beds. She taught those boys back there how to dig in the garden and help out with Daddy Bunny when they were growing <coughs> carrots and kale and spinach and all those good things. She taught some of the bunnies how to stir the stew and make it. She taught some of them how to sew and mend. She taught some of them how to, am I forgetting something in the household? Wash the dishes, oh my goodness, we all gotta wash the dishes. And she taught them how to sing and dance and draw pretty pictures to decorate the borough because we need to have the arts in our borough, right? And the littlest bunny, we don't have a little bitty bunny in here, but in here, the littlest bunny said, Mommy bunny, what can I do? She said, you can pull my chair out of the table and seat me there and teach everybody to say the blessing. God is great, God is good, and the thank you for this food. And so they did. They learned how to sleep. They learned how to make beds. They learned how to stir the stew. They learned how to do the chores. And they had time for quality time. And so it was. One Sunday, and one day, they heard <laughs> the whistle again, not this magic one, but a different one. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Grandfather Money announces that there will be auditions for the position of Easter Bunny on Saturday next. Come to the palace of the Easter eggs deep in the forest and audition. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> Bonnies, did you hear that? Oh, when I was a little bunny, I wanted to grow up to be an Easter bunny, but instead, I became a mommy bunny, and this is everybody's part, and you're the best mommy bunny in the whole wide world, that's all I'm And you're the best mommy bunny in the whole wide world. And so the next Saturday, <laughs> She put little hats on the heads of all the little boy bunnies. She put little ribbons in between the ears of the little girl bunnies. And she fluffed up everybody's little cotton tail. And they all went hippity hop and hippity. This is your part to everybody. Hippity hop and hippity hop and hippity hop, and hippity -hop, and hippity -hop and down through the woods to the palace of the Easter eggs. <gasps> and there they saw. Grandfather Bunny, yonder he is back yonder. I see him, he's got a stick with him. Grandfather Bunny's back yonder. Grandfather Bunny came out and said, hmm, everybody's in there. Were all kinds of bunnies getting ready to audition for the position of Easter Bunny. And Cottonmouth said to her, <coughs> now listen, we're going to stand over here to the side and we're going to be very quiet and watch. And if anything good happens, then you can say, yes, that's your part, everybody. Let's try it. Yes. And if nothing bad happens, that grandfather bunny, you'll take care. And so that's what they did. They all stood over to the side. Now grandfather bunny came out onto the porch. <whistles> Bodies, as you know, we have a position of Easter bunny, a highly respected position in our society. And in this story, there are five Easter bunnies. It takes that many to get around the world. And Brother Ursula, well, I think, uh, Sister here, she's getting too tired to do any of it, Sister Lorraine. So she's going to retire. We're going to have some carrot cake and spinach stew. And we're going to all enjoy that. But let me tell you first the criteria for being the Easter bunny. Now, everybody knows the Easter bunny must be swift. 
That's a given. But do you know there are other qualities the Easter Bunny must have? The Easter Bunny must also be kind of heart and wise of body. And so that's everybody's part. Let's try it. The Easter Bunny must be swift and kind of heart and wise of mind. And so we will get ready to audition for the position of Easter Bunny. And I'll say, man, bunnies flying in every direction, showing Grandfather Bunny how swift they were. And the good things were happening, and the little bunnies were over at the side, and they went ready your part. Yes, let's try it. Yes. But when bad things happened, well, you see, one of those long-legged jackrabbits saw a lop-eared bunny coming his way, and he poked up his paw, and that lop-eared bunny went crashing over. Grandfather Bunny saw all that, and Grandfather Bunny said, Honey Bunny, you're out of here. You can't be the Easter Bunny and pull mean tricks. Everybody knows the Easter Bunny's got to be kind of hard. And so another thing that happened was one of those little white bunnies saw that there was a hedge there and she needed to go around it, but she decided to fly right over it. She did, and she landed a smack down in a puddle of mud and water. <laughs> Honey bunny, you have to be smart. You can't do stupid things to be the Easter Bunny. You've got to be wise of mind. So, all right, I just do not see anybody out there who is going to qualify, but I do see these 21 little bunnies, and they all seem to be doing so well, and they're enjoying everything. So he approached Cotton Madam, are these your little bunnies? <gasps> oh, Grandfather Bonnie, I always wanted to meet you. When I was a little bunny, I wanted to grow up to be the Easter Bunny. But instead, I'm a mommy bunny. And the little bunnies all went, this is your part. And our mommy bunny, everybody, and our, our mommy, mommy bunny, bunny is the best mommy bunny, bunny in the whole wide world. Why, Cottontail, that's a very, very wise thing, a very kind thing. You must be truly kind of heart. But now, if you can the Easter Bunny, how could you leave your little bunnies who would take care of them? <gasps> Grandfather Bunny, they would take care of themselves. You see, these over here, they sweep the floor. These over here, they make the beds. These back here, they, they help in the garden, and they make the stew. They don't always put enough Tabasco in it because this is a southern story, but you know how that goes. <laughs> and, 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 and they do all this wonderful thing. And then they, they learn how to sing and dance because we have to have the arts in our burrow. And the littlest one pulls back my cheer and sings and tells everybody to say the blessing and at night sings to them. <gasps> Cottontail? That is the smartest thing I've ever heard of. You must be truly wise. But how could you be really fast? Oh, Grandfather Bunny, all of the mommies know how swift on the paw you have to be to be a mommy and get the job done. Sister Lorraine, I think we have a new Easter Bunny. What do you think? I think so, myself. Uh, all right, let's announce it then. Here we go. All right, bodies, the decision is made. Sister Lorraine agrees with me that the new fifth Easter Bunny will be our own little cottontail, the little country bunny. Who will be the Easter Bunny? Those long-legged jackrabbits and grandfather bunny must be losing it. Don't he know? Can't no girl bunny be the Easter Bunny? He must be quite bunny. Grandfather bunny. What are they thinking of? Doesn't he know the Easter Bunny's always a beautiful big white bunny? Grandfather Bunny was wise of mind, kind of heart. He knew what he was about. So on Easter Eve, Cottontail 
gathered up her basket and she told her little bunnies, now be sure you sweep the floor real well, be sure you tuck everybody in, be sure you teach everybody to sing. When at night I go to sleep, how many? Thirteen angels watch over me because I'm off to be the Easter Bunny. And she went hippity hop and hippity hop, come on, hippity hop and hippity hop to the palace of the Easter eggs. And there she saw Grandfather Bunny standing there on the porch and the other four bunnies because they knew Grandfather Bunny knew what he was about. He gave Cottontail her job and she looked and she saw there in the palace of the Easter eggs red eggs and blue eggs and purple, that's my favorite, and those fancy Russian eggs. She filled her basket, she got her assignment, she went all over Pearl River County and Stone County and she delivered eggs all night long. She was getting mighty tired when finally at the end of the day, Grandfather Bunny said, I have a special job for you. You see, there is one little child in the world who has not gotten an Easter egg. And that little child has been to St. Jude's Hospital lately and may not see another Easter. I want you to take this egg. Oh, Grandfather Bunny, it has roses. Look through the home. And there's little, little bunnies all skating. Oh, Grandfather Bunny, this is the most beautiful egg in the whole wide world. I want you to take that egg and deliver it. And it's hard to get there. That, that little child lives in the highest place in Pearl River County, wherever that is. And, and it's hard to get there because there are rocks and stones and pine trees all kind of falling around. I'll, I'll deliver it. She started, she had to go across the Pearl River and she went across on a, on a log. She walked and she walked and she went to the swamps and then she came to what was sort of a hill and she could see that at the top there was a light glimmering because in April, you know, it can be cold in April or Easter Eve. She started up the hill as best she could but she slipped on the rocks and she fell and she went flying down the hill and I didn't break the egg, but I think I broke my paw. Grandfather Bunny appeared as though I needed magic. Kind of a fairy story again, you know. <laughs> and he said, oh, Cottontail, you are very brave. Now, I want you to put on these little golden shoes. I like to try for the green ones. I don't know how shoes can help a grandfather bunny. It does feel better when I get them on. Yes, I do. And you, you take that egg and you'll find that those shoes are magic and they'll help you make it out of the way. So she took one green and she turned off. She went over the swamp and over the rocks and to that little house. The door was open just a crack because that little child was hoping against hope that maybe Someday, somebody would de deliver an Easter egg. And the cottontail went over to that little child and she put that most beautiful egg in the whole world down there. And she tweaked his nose, because that's how bunnies do it. They kiss. And she went out and she closed the door behind her because it is kind of cool on Easter Eve in April. And she flew down the hill. She flew across the Pearl River. She flew back to the palace of the Easter eggs. Oh, I am the Easter Bonnie, Grandfather Bonnie. Indeed you are. And she then gathered eggs and took them back and put them by the side of each of her little bunnies so that when they woke up, they knew that they had a visit from the Easter Bunny. Now, years have passed by and those little bunnies have grown up as bunnies do, and they have families of their own, but each Easter Eve, if they can, they come back, and you can hear them coming. 
take you to a place different from Poplarville. It's not near as hot and I'm going to tell you about what I did when I was in high school in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Now I was from the country and the other and about half the, the kids in the school were from the town and, uh, and and so the country kids played with the country kids and the city kids played with the city kids most of the time and and so on the weekends there was hunting and fishing and different things like that. But this was in the winter now. And in the winter, the winter is long in Steamboat Springs. The snow comes in November. It doesn't melt till April. Okay. And so this one weekend, I went to visit my, my good friend, David Bedell, up on the Elk River. He rode, the, uh, well, he was, by that time, he could drive to school. And uh, I was staying with him that weekend. and. And there's a bunch of other boys around there that what we're going to do for this weekend for fun. So we do have to do something for fun. Let's go put a bell on a bull elk. <laughs> that was what we decided to do for fun. Okay. Well, they had already figured out how to do it before. And they possibly had done it before. And this was my first time. But we were all good skiers. We could ski on uh, cross-country ski and climb hills and down hills and so on. And it was in uh, late winter and the elk had come down from the high mountains and they were in the hills just over the hay meadows. And at nighttime they would come down into the hay meadows and, and try to get into the haystacks and eat the cow feed. That's another story. But anyway, we knew where the elk were. They were up on the hill across the road from the where the hayfield was and and so in order to put a, a, a bell on a bull elk you first have to catch it and so here's here, here's the way you catch a bull elk you know where the bull elk are or the all the elk are cows and bulls and by this time the the bulls had not shed their antlers yet so you could tell the bulls from the cows and so we knew where they were, and so we went down the road a ways and 
where there was a kind of a little draw and we skied up that draw till we were way up above where the elk were. Then we skied over above where the elk were and we spread out as far as we could and skied down toward the elk. Because we could go pretty fast on going downhill on skis, as you well know. Well, here's the reason why it would work. Because the trails that the elk made were all back and forth on the hillside. And so when we skied down towards the elk and we spooked them, they had, couldn't run on these trails here. They had to jump off the trail and they were going into deep snow. And so when we finally picked out one particular elk, bull elk, that had jumped the trail, we stayed on him, stayed on him. And he would jump in the snow and he'd almost disappear. And he jumped some more and he kept going, kept going, kept going, till finally he was just completely winded. Now, if you know how much energy there is in an elk, it take there, it, it, it took a lot of wind out of him to break until he could finally stop. But he finally stopped. And we finally got up to him and threw it. We brought a rope, by the way. Got to have a rope if you want to catch a bull elk. So we had a lariat rope and it roped him around the antlers. Then what? Well, you got to. He, well, he's still, he's still huffing and puffing. He's all pooped out. He's, he's just give up right now. He's ready. But he's on the fight. But he's just standing there, huffing and puffing. He's on the fight. And we got this rope on him. But we need to take the rope and snub it around a tree. Well, it wasn't, we got to the end of the rope. It wasn't a tree. The tree was, the tree was a little ways off. And so my friend David Bedell says, I tell you what we'll do. You, Roy, you get the end of the rope. And when he jumps towards that tree, you snub it around him. And when I'm going to get up this hill and I'm going to swish down behind him and I'm going to jab him in the rear end with my, my ski pole and he'll jump that way and you can get him, right? Well, that would sound like a pretty good plan. So, <laughs> so what, he, what he did, he started down the hill and when he got about to ready to jab that bull elk in the rear end, the bull elk swung around there with his antlers and caught David's pants like that and ripped his pants. Didn't get any blood or anything. Well, that plan didn't work. <laughs> So the next plan was we were all going to get on one side of the elk and yell and holler and chase him towards the tree where Roy could get him around the tree. Well, so we got all got there and hollering and yelling and then he shake his head. We didn't know whether he was going to go that way or toward us. We didn't know. But it was, it was a matter of bluff. Who was going to, the bull was going to move or we were going to get run over. Because <laughs> he was starting to catch his breath by then. But luckily, might, you might say, he did go close enough to the tree, and we did get the rope around there, and we did snub him up to the tree. And that, that's what? If you're going to put a bull, a bell on a bull elk, you got to bring one. Got to bring a bell. So we did bring a bell. We were prepared. We had a rope and a bell. We snubbed him up to the tree. And a, and, and a, and a cow bell, well, you know what they are, they look like, because uh, Mississippi Bulldogs has them all the time, but they don't have a handle on them. They got a little loop, and you got a, a leather strap that goes around, and you put it around the neck, and, and, and that's what we had. They had the strap around, around the neck, put it on that bull elk, and there, we got the bull, got the bell on the elk, right? Now what? Well, we got to get the rope off somehow. And he's, he's really on the fight now. And he's got his breath back, and he's ready to fight anybody. Uh, you don't just un wind the rope from around the tree and then you lift the loop off his antlers uh -uh, that's not going to work you get behind the tree with a sharp knife and you cut the rope so that it's not around his antlers anymore and hope he doesn't come around the tree to get you he shook his head and he looked around it and away he went now that's the last we saw him but there was rumors that summer of the sheep herders that had sheep up in the mountains there. And by the way, all the sheep, the bands of sheep, there's about a thousand head of sheep in a band, and they usually have about one or two or maybe three different sheep that have a bell. And so when they hear the bell, they know where the sheep are. <laughs> and so they would be hearing this bell, and they would go looking for where the sheep were, and there was elk. So the rumors was 
<laughs> there was elk instead of sheep there. <laughs> and the sheep herders were the ones that told us about this, this, this elk with a bell on it. Well, that was that's just that one summer. That's the last we really heard about it. But I would imagine that there was probably a hunter that fall <laughs> that shot a bull elk. What's he going to say? He can't say I shot an elk with a bell on it. I'm going to say he just shot that elk and kept his mouth shut. <laughs> I'm going to volunteer next since I've got some grandbabies here. They may even have heard this story. I know their mama did because she helped to live it. We had enough pets. We were told no more pets. And I kind of agreed. We really don't have any room for pets. I was in the kitchen. I, I like to keep the doors open when there's a beautiful breeze. So I had the door open and I'm busy doing whatever you do. And I turned around and there was a black and white cat sitting in my kitchen. How she got there past all the kids and the dogs, I don't know. I said, well, oh, you, you need to get out of here. I don't need you. Well, I'm shooing her out of there, and she didn't like it. She liked sitting there right well. So she came after me. Claws bared. She clawed my legs up ferociously, and I wasn't happy. I finally grabbed a broom, and I'm chasing this cat out of the house. Whew. Go fix my legs up, because now they're all bleeding. Next day, the same scenario. What are you doing? Get out of my house. No, she cleaned house on me again. Now I look like I've been fighting with the tiger because I, my legs are just tattered and torn. Well, third day it happened that my husband had come home for lunch and he'd been asking me what on earth had happened and I was trying to tell him. He thought it was rather stupid, but what cat's gonna sit there and take this over and over and over, right? Here she comes, she's tearing me up. And I'm chasing her with the broom fervorously. And he's like, whoa, stop. Anything that little with that much gumption, she can stay in my house. Okay, we declared a truce. She allowed me in her kitchen <laughs> if I behaved myself. Because there were certain things she didn't want me to do and I better not. She picked out a chair and she said, that's mine. Don't touch it. You didn't touch it. She didn't <coughs> equal it up on you. And I got to look at her, where does this cat come from? I don't know, it was lots of dogs were dropped off, but cats, not so much. So I was asking a neighbor woman, I was telling her, she saw my legs and I was all bleeding and scarred. And she saw, I told her, this stupid black and white cat has decided that my kitchen is its. So she said, that's where she went. That's your cat? Well, no, not really. I was coming home from the store one day and this poor cat had been sitting there all day long. And she said, I stopped and went over and picked her up and she was so sweet and loving and I love cats. And she brought it home. She fed it cream and then she pet on it and it promptly came down to my place and beat the fire out of me. And she said, and every day it would come back over there and she'd feed it some more milk and try to get it to stay. You know, they say that animals pick who they want to live with, who they want to love. Well, she decided I was it. I don't know why. Anyhow, when that chair was in the kitchen, that was her spot. Better not try to move her because she'd sink her claws into you very well. Somebody would come to visit, they'd sit in that chair and she'd walk up to them growling ferociously and she'd stick one claw in their blue jeans and start pulling and they're like, 
okay, okay. I said, well, I'm sorry, you're, you're sitting in the cat's chair and they kind of give me a strange look. I said, well, that's how it is in this house. That's her chair. But they were quite willing to let her have it. So they said, I don't know why you put up with that cat. And I said, well, she's ours. She claimed us. We were moving from Louisiana over to Mississippi. Of course, you gotta bring your cat. Well, here she comes. She got under the brake pedal in Shell Met in traffic. <laughs> she wouldn't get out from under that brake pedal. I'm screaming and hollering and getting clawed to death. And the people around me are going to get away from there. I don't know what's wrong with her. I said, oh, okay, so we finally made the move. But here's how mean she got. She got an abscess on her leg. And I said, well, you know, it's our cat. We're gonna take her to the vet, get her fixed. We took, she was pathetic. She had a fever, she just laid there. We took her in there and they said, well, you know, she's really sick, we'll keep her. So every day I'd call over there, how's my cat? She's still sick. But one day I didn't even get to call them. They said, your cat's well, you need to come and get her. <laughs> So I went over and I got her. I, she cuddled all up to me. She'd do that until she decided to bite me. And I put her in the car and I took her home and they said, no, she's got to come back in for an antibiotic shot in about a week, but don't bring her in the shop. Just pull up in front of the door, honk your horn, get in the back seat, crack the window this much and hold her up there. <laughs> and they gave her the needle through the window. Well, she went spastic after that for a little while, and we went on home. So, yes, yeah, she was a mean little girl. And you know what I called her? I called her Calamity Jane. <laughs> because wherever she followed me, I usually was in a calamity. But anyhow, she stayed with us for years and years and years. And she was always just as sweet as she was the first day I met her. <laughs> I will. Are you okay? Come on. Okay. Well, now, you know, we're talking about cats and we're talking about Louisiana. I'm originally from New Orleans. I know you don't believe it, but darling, if I give it half a chance, the night floor will come back out. My daddy worked for the Jackson Brewing Company. He was a warehouse foreman. Now, that doesn't mean a whole lot unless you like trucks. And I love trucks. Because I'd get to visit with all the truck drivers when they'd come. One of the things that happens around the docks, uh, the, the truck dock, is animals show up. Sometimes they show up riding along with a trucker. Sometimes they just kind of wander up from the river and you never know where they came from, but they're there. Now my daddy was a staunch dog man. He was dogs all the way around. Big dogs, little dogs, and that was okay. As long as it was a dog. Had to be a canine. He had that definitely spelled out. Well, one day he came home with his little white spotted, white wood spots, I should say, white with gray spots. Cat. Daddy, that's not a dog. See, you can tell it's got a roundish face, not a muzzle, and it purrs, it doesn't bark. At that, that's not a dog. He said, I know, but look how scrawny it is. Look how pitiful it is. This poor thing's been hanging around the docks for a week. I've been feeding it scrap, but it's starving. And it's so sweet. It just winds up around my legs and just Oh, it purrs, and it's just such a good little creature. I couldn't leave it there anymore. I was afraid it was going to get run over. Because they'd run out there in the road, and you know, Decatur Street's a busy street. Okay. Daddy, you brought a cat home. What are you going to do with this cat? Well, I'm going to feed it. And then I'm going to find it a home, and it's going to be fine. I mean, after all, I wouldn't have brought it home if it were pregnant. You know what three good meals does to a stray cat? 
It makes them instantly a week away from delivery. <laughs> instantly. And the first thing you do, this little, pitiful, bony, white cat with gray spots, with this beautiful, plump, elegant, white cat with three kids. Rebecca, I blame it on you, except I had not yet met you at the time, because I know three is your magic exactly. number. <laughs> but three kittens. So here's my daddy, the dog man, which, by the way, we had dogs at the time, which the cat instantly cowed. That, you know, this little cat, big dog. Belgian Shepherds are not impressed with cats. Cats are even less impressed with Belgian Shepherds. Whop! Dog instantly in line. My daddy took this little cat and her three little kittens, and he found homes for those kittens when they came of age. He took that cat down to the vet and had it taken care of so that we would not have that problem again. I have later heard that situation referred to as cats falling apart, she would not fall apart anymore. She was all put together. Mm -hmm. That little old cat ruled the household for 10 solid years. We never knew how old she was when he found her, but she was 10 years old when she went to her heavenly reward. Over those years, she helped raise my son. She kept the dogs in line and we never, ever, ever had any critters that shouldn't be there. Unless you count the little white cat with gray stripes that the dog man brought home. Well, I got a question for you. What's that, Papa Joe? This will be a hard one. How many of you can think back and remember when you were 14 or 15 years old? Try not to. Oh, some of you ain't got there yet, but you're working on it. <laughs> All right, Frank was 14 and I was 15. And I needed me some driver's license. Well, back then, you just went down to the sheriff's office and told him that I, I want me some driver's license. He said, boy, you 15 years old? Yes, sir. You ain't lying to me. No, sir, I'm 15 years old. Can you drive? Yes, sir, I can drive. You sure? Yeah. Give me two dollars. He'd ride them out. And that was my driver's license. I never took a driver's test in my life. But me being 15, Frank 14, I went and acquired an A model Ford. Ooh, Model A. Now that thing, it was something else. We carried repair parts for us. All we needed was a screwdriver and a pair of pliers. <laughs> we carried extra points and condensers, and that was it. And we could get most anywhere. Gas was 17 cents a gallon. You could get apple for 25 cents. Back then, that was pretty good. But we was getting to feel like we were big boys. But the big boys would not let us into the big boy circle. We could get close enough to hear what they was talking about, but we didn't understand it. You know, and it seemed like pretty regular, the thing come up, they would be discussing the medicinal powers of the raw oyster. We couldn't figure that out. And Frank said, I know what we can do. Let's just go down and buy us a pint of raw oysters and eat them. Sounds like a good idea. We went down there. To 50 cents for a pint. We got 50 cents and we poured it. Y'all remember the porcelain top kitchen table? Not these fancy things, porcelain top. We poured them things out on there and scattered them and they were seven of them. Now that was three apiece plus one extra. And Frank, we wanted to have that one. Now he didn't want to just cut it in half. He wanted to have it this way <laughs> and lay it flat where it looked like we had four apiece. Now they was laid out there. Now Frank had an older sister that had went to college. And at that time in Poplarville, Mississippi, girls did not wear short pants. 
that was out. I had never seen a girl wearing a sword of peace. But Virginia had come home from college for a while, and she come walking through there wearing some short pants. <laughs> I just looked the other way. They was embarrassing to me, you know. And she looked over there, and, and she said, what are y'all doing? Well, I did not know how to talk back to a sister because I didn't have <coughs> one. And we didn't want them to push us around. Frank said, it ain't none of your bees wax. <coughs> That's the first good answer. He knew how to talk back to his sister. She got over there and bumped up against the man. She said, Joe, what are you doing? And I didn't want to chicken out. <coughs> I ran back. I said, what does it look like we do? She said, eating boogers. <laughs> Off she went. Well, we eat them raw oysters. Frank said, you feel any different? I said, no. Do you? No. He said, well, the problem is we just ain't ate enough of them. Now, you got driver's license, and you got that, that model A, and we can put 50 cents worth of gas in there and go to Bay St. Louis to one of them oyster bars and just eat all the oysters we want. We had a dollar apiece in our pocket, and we was fixed. I mean, we had the money. I said, that sounds like a good idea. We had to be back for dark now. You know the folks. They require certain things, though. So we took off to Bay St. Louis. Now, back then, boys could go in anywhere. It didn't want no age limit and all that kind of stuff. And there was Will's Oyster Bar. Gee, we parked up there. Opened the door, stepped in there. Come on back, boys, and join the bunch. Now, there was a, a bar there, half this way, half that way, and the place you walk in. And man, Will, Will Stringer, he owned that place. And he had a whole sack of orchard dumped out on the table. Now he had opened them things. There was about six, seven people sitting down there, three down here and four there. And that top of that bar was kind of wet. He popped that thing open on that half shelf, slide it down there, and it stopped right in front of the person that was to get the next one. Now he knowed how to handle it, but he could do it just right. Sit down there, would you? We come to eat us some of them raw oysters. Well, just pull your stool up and we will see you get what you come back in. Now, Frank, that, that, they took a liking to us. They started going to train them. How you mix up that stuff, what you dip it in, ain't much flavor to a raw oyster. So you add the flavor to it. Now, they had some mustard, and ketchup, horseradish, two or three more things, and there was a little old bottle of something about that high. <laughs> and it was sitting there and it had a little road on it, Louisiana Bull, undiluted nectar of the cayenne pepper tree. Whoo! When you take the top off, it looked like smoke arising out of there. <laughs> I mean, that was some strong stuff. He said, now boys, a little dab of Louie of this year and put that in there and mixed it up. Now we got to eat and we, we'd get raw, our time get raw oyster and eat that thing. Well, old Frank, now he wanted to be independent and grow up fast. So he developed him a oyster eating style. He was a slurp in them things. <laughs> mm, they said, man, he's really enjoying them things. <laughs> now we were sitting there, uh, uh, they took us right into the fellowship. I, they were treating us good. Now there's double doors coming in that place and all at once them doors busted open and there was a sight I would never forget. Standing about six foot two, shoulders only that wide, built down like that. Red hair put parted right down the middle, bare grease going each way, glued it down there real good. Big smile on his face. Had on a black and yellow checkerboard suit that had been bought at an early age and extended as he growed, but he outgrowed the extensions. <laughs> now, the, the pants come up about halfway a shin and the coat sleeves hit about here on him there and he hollered, hello you all. I am the chicken man from Illinois. I came south with a load of chickens where you could have some southern fried Yankee food. And I decided while I was here, I'd take advantage of my opportunity 
to eat me some of them raw oysters. He didn't say oysters, they was oysters. <laughs> Come on up in here, just call me Chick. I'm the chicken man. Pulled him up the stool and they said, well, Chick, he said, how do they go? Dollar a dozen, I'll shuck them and you eat them. Said, Dollar a dozen for them things? I tell you what, I'll trade you two chickens for a dozen of them more. That's the deal, put up a chair. Now he sat down between me and Frank. He sat right there. About that time, Frank was a slurping on one. <laughs> he slapped Frank on the back. He said, Slick, you can throw a craving on anybody. Well, now, he messed it. When he put his hand on Frank, he done made a mistake. Frank didn't take to that, no. He looked, I could tell right off. He done had a hump in his back. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Frank, you ain't supposed to seek revenge when we're out having fun now. He didn't say nothing. He saw the hard, slide them on down here, slide them down. Frank said, wait a minute, wait a minute, chick. If you're going to be a raw oyster eater, now Frank, you start eating these things. You got to learn how to do it. <laughs> There's a certain thing you got to do. The first oyster you ever eat, there's a certain way you got to eat him. You got to swallow him whole. You don't chew him up. You don't grease him. You don't put nothing on him. You swallow him whole. About that time, Will slung one down there and he was going by. Frank, he had his pocket knife out. He stuck it, picked him up. He look at him, look at him with him. Throw him in his mouth, swallowed him. Think he can do that. I can do it, I can do it, slide it to me. All right, he slid him down there. Chick grabbed that oyster, throwed him in his mouth and swallowed him and looked around a big smile on his face and Frank fell off that stool. Oh, you swallowed him alive. You didn't even kill him. Oh, good, don't you think he gonna know a hole? Is he coming out? I said, front there any time now. You're a dead man, chick. There ain't no way. Oh, don't let him kill me. I'm too young to die. Do something. Do something. About that time, Frank made his move. He reached over and grabbed the bottom of that loose end. <laughs> Pulled that top off. He said, chick, you got one chance. Drink this remedy. He handed it to him. He turned that bottle up and sucked the bottom out of it. <laughs> and about that time it hit him. He got real still and his eyeballs turned back and white was a show. And he fell flat on his face. Bow! Sitting there checking. Y'all know how a dog sleeping in the snow how he, he has them quivers? Old chick was sitting there and he, he quiver every once in a while. And Will said, Reckon I ought to call the doctor. Frank said, Let him lay. Now, he's a 14-year-old boy. Let him lay. He laid there, he's shaking. A little while, about 30 minutes or longer, he kind of roused up. He got on his all forward, on over there, and he got a hold of Frank and started climbing up. He got up there and he said, Slick, I owe you my life. <laughs> I could feel it. When that third remedy hit him, it was like a tornado. That was a terrible fight, but that stuff killed him. I just owe you my life. I don't know how I can ever repay you. Frank said, thank nothing of it, chick. That's one down and let him to go. Well, slide him another. That man turned and ruined and we never owe him. <laughs> <laughs>